I'm yeah. still impressed thinking about it. It was beautiful. It was beautiful. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. He's an, he's an amazing man, and God has done incredible things in our relationship. And, you know, just anybody who's either married in the process of going that direction or one day will be married, I just want to encourage you just never give up. Never, ever, ever give up. We had a rough first five years of marriage, but God was faithful, and he brought us through it. And he didn't just bring us through it. He miraculously brought us through it. And, and we are completely different people and have... A, a relationship that is richer than anything I could have ever asked for or expected. Never thought we'd be where we are today. So glory to God, all glory to God, Amen. all glory to God. So let me share with you guys um, what I, pr- I prayed before I came and I said, Lord, what is your heart? What is your heart for the people that I'm going to be, be speaking to? And what do you want me to share with them? And I waited and I waited and I waited. And one night when I very much wanted to go to bed because I was very tired. The Lord said, no, I think you're going to stay up and we're going to talk a little bit. And so, um, I was just laying in bed trying to fall asleep and I had a vision of a Christmas tree with presents underneath it. And actually I saw it in this room and it was right here, pretty much where that tree actually is. Um, yeah. And there were Christmas gifts all underneath that, the tree. And then I saw a second vision right afterwards and it was the same tree, but all the gifts were gone except for like one or maybe two. And I knew immediately what the Lord was saying. And what he was saying was, I have gifts that I want to give my children that have been left under the tree. And I want them to come and get it and unwrap it and unlock it. And so um, there are a lot of gifts that we can receive from the Lord. And there's no way this morning. By the way, what time do I need to be done? Whenever. Okay. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) I actually asked my friend in the back. I said, I said, pray for me that uh, I don't speak for two hours. And she said, I'm not going to pray for that. It's not going to be two hours, I promise. Um, But guys, there are a lot of gifts that we can receive from the Lord, a lot of different things. And there's no way that I could touch on everything um, in one day or in one morning. Um, But there are three categories I felt the Lord highlight to me that he's wanting to to speak into for you guys. And I want to say before I pray and before we get into it, I want to let you know that all three of the gifts that we're going to talk about this morning are for each one of you. It's not that one is for each of you or two or three. All three of them are for each of you. But what I, what I believe so strongly that the Lord showed me is that in this season, that there's one, maybe two, but that there's one that the Holy Spirit's wanting to highlight to you right now, today, to say, this is what I'm calling you into. And so we're going we're gonna to dig into those. But with that being said, I just want to ask you guys this morning, if you will just turn your ears to heaven. You know, the old school radios, they had the dials and you had to like take the dials and turn them to get just to the right station, right? I want you to just turn your ears to heaven. And if you don't hear a word of what I say, I don't care. I just want you to hear the Father speaking to you. So listen for his voice, not mine, and you'll be blessed this morning, okay? So let's pray. Father, thank you for your goodness. Thank you that you are the creator of the universe. You are the sustainer of our lives. I thank you, Father, that we have breath in our lungs because you chose to give it to us. We worship you. You are the giver of good gifts. You love us so immensely. And I'm so confident that you're here this morning and that you want to bless your people. So, Father, open our eyes. Give us eyes to see. Remove any any hindrance that the enemy would throw our way to not receive from you this morning the gift that you have for us. Give us eyes to see and ears to hear your heart for each one of us. And, Father, I believe that it's going to be specific and individual for each person in the room. So let us hear your voice this morning. We thank you in advance for what you're going to do, and we worship you because you are worthy. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Sometimes I wonder why I even put makeup on. <laughs> I mean, it's like, what's the point? <laughs> okay, so what are the three gifts that um, the Father revealed to me that he's wanting to talk about this morning? Um, presence, position, and pardon. Before I break down each one of those, I want to give you guys a definition, actually three definitions of the word gift. A present a special ability or talent or something acquired without being earned by the receiver. So each one of those could be a sermon in and of itself, but I don't have time for that. So I'm just asking you guys to buckle your seatbelts and hold on while I pack in a lot in a short amount of time, okay? So let's start unwrapping the gift of his presence. 
the first definition for the word gift that I gave you was a present. What do we all, what do we all used to say in school when they would do roll call? Present, meaning I'm here, right? We say present when we're in the room and God's presence is the first gift that we're going to unwrap. It's all about him being present with us. I'm going to read to you guys. I have a lot of scriptures this morning that I'm going to read to you. And what I did is kind of condensed them. So I pulled some things out just to make it easier to like follow along with me. So we're starting with Psalm 16. And I want you guys just to listen. Just listen for the value that David places on the presence of the Lord. Okay. I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. I have no good apart from you. The sorrows of those who run after another God will multiply. I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my whole being rejoices. You make known to me the path of life. In your presence, there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. How beautiful is that? There is, there is no question in David's mind that in your presence is fullness of joy. Everything I could ever want, the fullness of satisfaction, everything I've ever craved in life, everything I ever thought I want, it falls away in your presence. In your presence is fullness of joy. So let me ask you something. Depression, anxiety, fear, shame, condemnation, anger, bitterness, unforgiveness. Do any of you believe that in the same moment of time, fullness of joy and any of those things can coexist? They can. In the same moment of time, we can experience those things and we do experience those things in life. And I'm not denying that the enemy attacks us and he comes and he wants us to be in that place. But the reality is that the presence of God in the presence of God is fullness of joy. The presence of God just destroys all of that. Every single thing that I just listed robs us of our joy. So the question is, is God inviting you into a season to unwrap the gift of his presence with you in a deeper way? Exodus 33. Moses said, if I've found favor in your sight, please show me now your ways that I might uh, know you in order to find favor in your sight. And the Lord said, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. And Moses said to him, if your presence won't go with me, don't bring us up from here. How will anyone know that you're pleased with me and your people unless you go with us? What else will distinguish me and your people from all the other people at the face of the earth? And the Lord said to Moses, I'll do the very thing you've asked because I'm pleased with you and I know you by name. Moses said, please show me your glory. And he said, I'll make all my goodness pass before you and proclaim before you my name, the Lord. I don't know if you caught it, the progression is wild right there. Moses said, show me your ways. I want to find favor with you. The Lord said, I'll do it. Moses said, "Mm, you know what? Don't even send us if you're not going to come with us. The Lord said, I'll do it. And he's like, show me your glory. He keeps going deeper and deeper. Moses is so desperate for the fullness of the presence of God that he said, you know what? I'm not just satisfied to know your ways. I'm not just satisfied to have your favor. You know what? I'm also not just satisfied for you to tell me that you're going to come with me and that, and that I don't have to have you alone. Show me your glory. Did you notice that at each point, God's heart and his response was yes? If you, can't, if you hear that story, and if you hear those verses and you don't comprehend that it is the Father's heart to say yes to give you his presence, then just ask him to open your eyes. It is his heart. So when was the last time that you felt desperate for him like Moses did? When Christmas rolls around, oftentimes people make wish lists. Are you in a season where you need to ask God for the gift of his presence like Moses did? Genesis twenty-eight sixteen. Then Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. Do you need the Holy Spirit to awaken you? As he awoke Jacob out of his sleep to realize the Lord is in this place, and I didn't know it. David said in the Psalms, Where can I go from your spirit, or where can I flee from your presence? The reality is that David knew that God is absolutely everywhere. There's not a single place you can go. You can't, excuse me for being crude, but you can't go to the bathroom without him. He's everywhere. The spirit of God. Scripture says that 
the globe, before God began to create the universe, the entire globe was covered with water and the spirit of God hovered over the water. Yeah. He's literally everywhere. Do you need the Holy Spirit to awaken you to the reality of his presence all around you? The problem is we're often too busy to doing our own thing to stop and recognize that he's there. And one of the things I've learned in my life is just that taking seconds to just close my eyes and stop, to stop doing the dishes, to stop running the errands, to stop the ministry, to stop all the, the, the meetings and the work and just to stop for 10 seconds even and close my eyes and say, show me your face. And in that moment, fullness of joy is restored to me. The reality of his presence with me is restored to me. And I know that he's right there. Are you in a season of needing to ask God to awaken you to the gift of his presence? To open your eyes as he did Jacob. And Jacob said, the Lord is here and I didn't even know it. I want to share with you before I, before I move forward that this right here, this gift is the highest priority in life. And we're going to talk about some other things too, but this right here is everything. You don't want to do anything without him. You don't want to get in your car and drive without him because who's to say you're, you're going to be protected. You don't want to stand up in a pulpit without his presence with you because you don't trust me. You don't want to say something that's not the father's heart. You don't want to do, you don't want to choose a spouse without him because you might not get it as good as I did. <laughs> He's shaking his head. I love you. <laughs> Presence with God and intimacy with him is always number one. And I want to remind you that in Matthew, I'm going to share that later. Do I want to share it now? I'm going to, I don't care. In Matthew, Jesus looked at people who came to him and said, but God, didn't we do all these things in your name? Didn't we, didn't we heal the sick? Didn't we cast out demons in your name? Didn't we prophesy? And the Lord looked at him and said, I never knew you. You knew the right things to do, but I didn't know you. That right there shows you presence and intimacy is everything. So this first gift, the gift of presence, will always be number one. And I believe for some of you, this season is a season where God's saying, come deeper with me. Get to know me. Fall in love with me on a deeper level. So gift number two, the gift of position. When I say the gift of position, what I'm referring to is the position that God has called you to in the body of Christ. So my left arm has the position of the upper portion of the left side of my body, right? So it's the position that God's called you to in the body of Christ. And God tells us clearly in his word that to every person in the body of Christ, he's given a gift to be used for the benefit of the church. You're meant to be positioned within the body to serve and to help it function at its highest capacity. That song, served people get saved, saved people serve, right? It's beautiful. So let's read in 1 Corinthians where Paul discusses how the gifts work among us. And again, just, you know, if you, if you readdress this later, I want to let you know I pulled and, and kind of, I didn't change the words, just pulled uh, just to make it easier to read. So this is a little bit long, but you guys just stick with me, okay? Now there are varieties of gifts, but the same spirit. And it's the same God who empowers them all in everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the spirit for the common good. For to one is given through the spirit the utterance of wisdom. And to another, the utterance of knowledge, according to the same spirit. To another, faith by the same spirit. To another, gifts of healing by the one spirit. To another, the working of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, the ability to distinguish mm -hmm. between spirits. To another, various kinds of tongues. To another, the interpretation of tongues. All these are empowered by one and the same spirit, who apportions to each one individually as he wills. For just as the body is one and has many members, all the members of the body, though many, are one body. So it is with Christ. The body doesn't consist of one member but of many. If the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I don't belong to the body, that wouldn't make it any less part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I don't belong to the body, that would not make it any less part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would be the sense of hearing? If the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? But God arranged the members in the body, each one of them, as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? There are many parts, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Nor the head say to the feet, I have no need of you. But God so composed the body that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. So I want you guys just to picture the human body, right? And, and picture each limb as its own fully operational entity in and of itself, okay? 
if my right arm is super strong, super healthy, I've got a bomb right arm, I can maybe come over here and pick this thing up right here. I'm not going to do it because I don't trust myself. But I could maybe pick that thing up and, I, and I, could, I could help this body pick this thing up, right? But if that right there needed to get from right here over to that corner, I couldn't do it without my legs. I couldn't do it without my feet. And quite frankly, I couldn't do it with my, without my eyes either because I trust, trust me, I'd trip on something. So if you just take that one illustration and recognize that like each person in this room has been given a gift by the Holy Spirit to use to serve the body of Christ, you'll understand that you can't operate without each other. And if my arm, let me say this too, in the regards of pride and humility, you may have like one of those glory gifts, right? Like maybe you're called to be a healing evangelist and travel the world and, and, and at some point millions of people know your name. You better not get prideful because I can tell you right now, this arm can do nothing without the legs. And the people that you see that are in those higher positions and even in, the, in these scriptures, it talks about giving honor to everybody. Outdo one another in honor the scriptures say, right? So never become prideful about it, but recognize that the body needs you. Whatever your gift is, the body needs you to operate at its highest capacity. If I only had one leg, maybe I could hop my way over there. Maybe. But the best way for my body to operate, the best way for this body to operate, the best way for the body of Christ to operate is if each part is fully healthy, doing its thing, doing what it was called to do. I want to address one thing before we move on. Some people think of their role in serving the church through the lens of their age. And I love that we have all ages in the room. Let me read you a quick scripture and then share a truth with you to help you out with that. 1 Timothy 4.12. Don't, look, don't let anyone look down on you because you're young. But set an example for the believers in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. So obviously that's for the young people and it's saying it doesn't matter how old you are. Did you guys know that in China, I believe it's China, if I'm getting my location wrong, forgive me, but I do know what I'm about to tell you is true. That there is a country, I believe it's China, in, in, the, in the church there where when you get saved, they transition you to be a leader. So they have eight-year-olds that are leading the six-year-olds. They have 10-year-olds that are leading the eight-year-olds. They have 15-year-olds that are leading the 10 to 12-year-olds. And they continuously keep you in a place of leadership. Why? Because it's right here. Don't let anyone look down on you because you're young. Set an example for the believers, which means that as young people, you can set an example for those that are in their prime. But let me transition. For those of you who think you've passed your prime, I disagree. Job 12, 12. A lot of people, let me say this. A lot of people reference Joel 2, 28, um, which says, uh, in the last days, I'll pour out my spirit on all flesh. You know, your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will have visions and your old men will dream dreams. I might be mixing those two up. But, it, but it's, people use that scripture a lot to talk about um, the need for the older generation in the body of Christ. But I've got something else that I want to share with you. Job 12, 12 says, wisdom is with the aged, understanding in length of days. I want to just define for you wisdom because this is so important to me. Wisdom is the ability to think and act, utilizing experience, understanding, common sense, insight, and accumulated knowledge. So let me give you an example. Humility is a great example. Let's say a young person might know pride is bad and humility is good. And so maybe that young person says, Father, help me to not be prideful. And they pray and they say, help me not be prideful. Let me be humble, Father. But maybe as someone who's older, you've learned over your lifetime that fasting humbles us. That praying every night on your knees before the king humbles us. And maybe through your accumulation of knowledge, and understanding in length of days, you know things that the younger generation can do to partner with these things. We need you. And I just want to say, we are living in a time where my generation and the younger generation especially believe that they can, they can do it on their own. We're being fed this message of you be isolated, figure it out on your own. You're smart enough. You've got this. You don't need anybody else. And it is foolishness and it will destroy you and it will destroy the church. So to anybody in this room who considers themselves in the elderly category, please understand that we desperately need you. 
We need your wisdom. We need your insight. We need your experience throughout life to teach us, to show us how to wage war in the spirit. I had the most beautiful conversation with Miss Ruby when I was here last. And I just remember, I just remember what it felt like to sit here and listen to her heart for prayer. And she had come in here that I would pray with her, but I asked her to pray for me because I need what she has. We need each other. So you're not too young to minister in the body of Christ and you're not too old. We all need each other. And we should be fighting to be everything. Amen. We should be fighting for to be everything that God has us to be until our last moment on this earth. God made a point in his word to highlight an honor. honester. God made a point in his word to highlight and honor ministers of the gospel of all ages. The question is, are you ready to search for, that's key, are you ready to search for the unwrapped gift of God that has been given to you? Open it and use it for the ministry of the gospel. Okay, we've talked about the gift of presence. We've talked about the gift of position. And the last gift that I want to talk about is the gift of pardon. What do I mean? I'm referring to the gift of salvation. The definition of pardon is the action of forgiven, forgiving or being forgiven for an error or offense. Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. The free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So I wanted to share with you my story. Um... Because this concept of the gift of pardon and the gift of salvation is obviously it's precious to any of us who have inherited salvation. But it carries a different meaning for me. Um, When I was 16 years old, I met Jesus. And I met him because there was a girl on my soccer team. I had a very foul mouth. And there was one girl on our soccer team who never said any cuss words. And I was like, I wonder if I offend her. And so I went up to this girl and I said, hey, you know, I noticed that you don't ever cuss and I do it a lot. And I just wanted to ask you, you know, does it offend you when I do that? And she's like, no, it doesn't offend me. She said, I used to cuss too. And I started reading scripture and it helped me to stop. I said, hmm, okay. And something, some kind of switch flipped in me. And I was like, I want to meet, I want to, I want to try this Jesus out. And I did. And I tried him out through his word. But when I say I tried him out, I really did. A lot of people are like, yeah, I'll try church. And then they like go to church one time, but they don't try out a relationship with Christ. I could not have known I was going to marry this man if I didn't date him. Like, I, I understand that there's a reality of arranged marriages, but we're not living in that culture. I didn't know I was in love with him. I didn't know he was the man I wanted to spend my life with until, until I spent time with him, right? So I met Jesus through his word and I fell in love with him and I gave my life to Christ when I was about 16 years old and I sold out. I sold out and for the next about 10 years, I was a passionate lover of Jesus and um, eventually around the age of 23, I think, um, we had moved back to Columbia and had gotten involved with church and I had begun ministry, outreach ministry, evangelism. And, um, and I loved it. I began to see the sick healed. I began to see, uh, wild prophetic words come forth and, and just a lot of beautiful miracles. And I loved it. I became addicted very quickly. And one day I was spending time with the Lord, which apparently was not a very common thing at the time because uh, I heard the Holy Spirit speak to me so clearly. And he said, I want you to stop all forms of ministry. And I said, okay. And the next thing I heard shook me. The Lord said to me, the last thing I want for you is for you to die just to find out you never knew me. And I was like, whoa, okay. And so then from that day on, I stopped all forms of ministry. I pulled back. I stopped, I stopped going out. I, I didn't do anything. And I just began this journey to come to find out who the Lord was. And he supernaturally took me through this journey. There's nothing that I could have really like done on my own. To, I just said yes to him. But he began to show me broken areas of my heart that I didn't know were there. Pain from my past, wounds from things people had done to me that I didn't know was there. And he would, he would bring these things up. He would show me these things. And then I would basically curl up into a fetal position and just weep and cry. And I would feel all of the pain of the things I had gone through. And my husband can attest to you, this, this lasted probably three to four months of almost daily I was weeping because I was in so much pain. But what would happen every single time is that the father would come, I'd feel all this, and he would come and he'd heal it. And not only would he heal it, then he would say, now let me replace this with my truth about who I really am to you. 
and it was beautiful until one day I had a revelation of how horrible and how wretched of a human being I was. Um, and I, I just remember thinking, uh, there's a, there's a particular scripture that addresses a sin issue and says, if you don't even do this, you're, you're worse than the pagans. Cause at least the pagans, and if you don't know what a pagan is, somebody who worships the devil, worships other gods, basically. If you don't do this thing, you're worse than the pagans. Cause at least they do that. And I realized in that moment I was worse than the pagans and I was horrified. I was horrified by the depravity of my spirit, my soul, my flesh. And so I was grieved by that. And then the Lord began to continue to work in my heart. I was reading a book at the time about a revival that broke out in, um, I believe it was in China and, um, it was beautiful. I, I, I think it, the name of it is visions beyond the veil. If you want to read it, you can actually get the free PDF online. Um, and the story was beautiful and I was just, I was enthralled with it. Well, one night I was reading and, um, it was about one o'clock in the morning and I was like, golly, I really need to go to bed. It's pretty late. And my husband said, I'm going to go take a shower. And so I was getting ready to put this thing up and, um, I had, it was like a, a little voice, Holy Spirit said, just see what the next subtitle is. And what I didn't tell you is that I met Jesus when I was 16 and I loved him and I gave my life to him, but I can't tell you how many times from 16 to 26, I wrestled with him, I saved. There were almost, almost once a year, if my memory serves me correctly, I had a thought, if I die today, am I going to go to hell? And I was afraid of that. And so it's one o'clock in the morning, I'm sitting on the couch, my husband's gone up to take a shower, and I heard the Holy Spirit say, just check and see what the next subtitle is. And so I did. And it was how to find your way back home. And I was like, oh, this is it. Because remember, for 10 years, I'd been searching, how do I, how do I know that I'm saved? And, I, and I, I never could get an answer that satisfied me. And so I sat there and I was like, okay, well, I have to read it because I don't want to go to bed tonight because who's to say I'm going to wake up tomorrow? I never knew what would happen to me day, but none of us do. Nobody knows what's going to happen to us day by day. And I didn't know if I was going to wake up the next day and I couldn't stand the thought of going to bed without at least a chance of maybe this is it. Maybe this is going to answer my question for me. And so I read it. And the, the man that was writing the book said, in regards to the story of how he got saved, that he realized all he had to do to be saved was to do nothing. And all he had to be was to be a sinner. And it was like, my life just flashed before my eyes. And I realized that like, yes, I knew Jesus. Yes, I loved him. Yes, I wanted to give him everything, but that's all I did was give him. And I'd been spending all this time plowing my fingernails through the concrete of life, trying to dig my way to heaven, to do all the right things, to be good enough, to, to not cuss, to not get drunk, to not watch the bad things, to whatever. I was trying so hard to do all the right things to get my way into heaven. And I realized in that moment, You've shown me over these last four months that I can't do anything for myself. Everything. If I love you, it's because you first loved me. If I choose to open my Bible, it's because you inspired me to do it. I can't heal myself. I can't purify my depraved, ugly heart. I can't be anything good apart from you. And so this desperation to just give it, give it all to him and say, okay, I'm done came over me and my prayer of salvation that day guys was okay yes I just sat there and I and I thought and I I pictured it and I and I recognized what it meant that I was saying like I can't earn this I'm done I'm done trying to earn it I can't do it the answer is yes and that was my prayer of salvation I said yes to receiving the gift of God and I want to just I want you to picture oh by the way uh I have not once since, since that day, which was September 12th, 2016, I have not once questioned whether or not I'm saved since then. Amen. Praise God. I want you to picture Christmas and, and you know, I know obviously we got other things happening between now and Christmas, but we're going to just jump ahead to December. I want you to picture Christmas and imagine that on Christmas Day, I come to you and I have a present for you and you have a present for me, okay? And let's say that I come to you and I'm like, here, you want it? And you take that gift. But you say, what about mine? Can I give you mine? And I say, no. 
That's what my life was. I had given him my life, but I had not said yes to the free gift he was trying to give me because I've been trying to pay for it. It's like you come and you give me a sweater for Christmas and I'm like, okay, how much money do I owe you? It's not how it works. And that's not how salvation works. So my question for you is, have you been working and fighting day in and day out to be good enough, to earn your way to heaven, to do all the right things? If the answer is yes, are you ready to let go and receive the free gift of salvation? Scripture says in 2 Corinthians 6, Behold, now is the day of salvation. Today you can know that your name is written in the book of life. Today. You don't have to wait another moment. Right now where you're sitting, you can give God your yes. And that striving can be done. Will it cost you everything in life? Yes. Will you lay down your life at the altar and die to yourself? Yes. Will it flip your life on its head? Yes. But it is a free gift that you cannot earn. And the only one who can transform you is the King of Kings, whose blood shed on the cross does the transforming work in your life. So which is, which is it for you? Is it presence? Is it position? Is it pardon? I want to give you one last illustration moving forward. Sugar, can you come up for me? I want you guys just to watch this interaction. <clears throat> Here you go. Thank you. Okay. I have a present for you. No, thank you. Why not? Uh, I, don't, I don't need it. Can you please? I really think that you're going to love it. Uh, not, not right now. Just take it. Just take it. Just look like a loving interaction between people that care about each other? No. <laughs> Why did I do that? Why? Thank you, baby. You can sit down. Why did I do that? Why did I want you to see that? Because that wasn't love. Now, and I'm not saying that what he did wasn't, what I did wasn't love. To demand that somebody take this from me when I want to give it to just because I think you're going to like it, that's not love. Why am I saying that to you? Because I cannot leave you today without telling you that God is not a demanding, forceful father who's going to make you receive the gift he wants to give you today. Every single one of those three things, you have to give it your yes. Whether it's saying yes to salvation, yes to the free gift he's offering you, you have to give him your yes and then you have to pursue him. If it's the presence of God, you have to say no to the movie, no to the hanging out with friends to get that to receive from him. If it's the gift of position, you have to say, yes, I'm going to search out what you've called me to be. He will not force you to do it because he loves you. And earlier today, I talked about how the presence of God is the, is the most important thing in all of life. It's because relationship is everything to him. And God will not destroy his relationship with you just to demand you receive something from him. So today is your day to say yes. What is it that he has for you? I hear him. He knows what's in the bag. He knows that it's going to bless you. But it's yours to receive by faith and to act upon by choice. And like a loving father, so eager to pour out his blessings on his child, I hear him saying, will you open it today? I can't wait for you to experience this. So I want to pray. And then if anybody wants to just receive prayer, if today... If today is your day of salvation, if you've realized today, I've been spending my life fighting tooth and nail to do enough, to be enough, and I'm done. I'm putting that at the foot of the cross and I'm saying yes to that. I do not want you to hide that. I want you to say yes and I want you to tell your church family. Let us celebrate with you. Let us rejoice with you and let your brothers and sisters in here come alongside of you and help you in your new life. If today is your day of salvation, make it known. Tell somebody. So I'm going to pray, and then if anybody wants prayer, um, we, can, we can just transition to that. We'll okay? play a song, and we'll sing a song, and then they can cool. come up. And... Awesome. Right. Well, Father, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you for today. Thank you for your goodness, your love, your faithfulness. Thank you that you are the Father of lights, that every good gift comes down from you. Every good gift, whether that gift is the gift of breath in our lungs to live another day, whether it's the gift of, of entering into a deeper dimension of your presence, experiencing you on a greater level, whether it's, the, whether it's the gift of the spirit that you've bestowed upon us to bless the church and to further your kingdom, or whether it's the gift of salvation, you are the giver of good gifts. And we thank you. 
You, Jesus, are our greatest gift. We love you. We surrender to you. We worship you. And we want you to know you've done enough for us. You are our greatest gift. And Father, even though we know and we confess that you've done enough, I know you. And I know you have more. There is always more with you. There are always greater dimensions to knowing you deeper, more intimately, to getting to, to realize more about your character. There's more that you have for us to do in the earth. There's more. And I know that there is. And so we thank you for all that you've done. We worship you for all you've done. We honor you. We glorify you. We humble ourselves before you knowing that we don't deserve any of these gifts. Not one of them. But you're a good daddy. You are a good, good father who said, I want to bless my children. Father, give us everything that we need to receive this gift today. We love you. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Amen.